they're hardening the, the physical and cybersecurity perimeter around what is our national critical resource. And they're incorporating, they're working hard to incorporate renewables as they're coming online. And you know, New York State and the federal government have some pretty aggressive um, targets that they're trying to hit. So uh, that, that means incorporating renewables as they come online, but also the impact of hydrogen, hydrogen pilots, and, um, and modifying the transmission and distribution backbone to adapt to the demands that are coming at us from EVs and transitions to residential solar and heat pumps and all of that. So if you think about what this really means, we've got an airplane it's in flight, it's full of people, and we're not swapping out a part. <laughs> we're swapping around the entire guts of the machine as it's flying in the air. So uh, just that's, that's for me the best analogy I can give. <clears throat> but the next step for us after doing the research, building those relationship maps and starting those conversations is establishing a consistent schedule of meetings where we can collectively share information and ideas and explore what's possible now and in the near future, right? So we want to, we want to think big. We want to think, you know, tell me why not, right? Tell me what the obstacles are and let's see if we can get them out of the way because there are, there's a ton of money out there right now. One thing is clear. We have a unique opportunity. It's just a brief window in time that all of this money is focused on this problem and we represent the poster child for this problem. And so I'm very excited um, that, that we're doing this work and I'm really looking forward to getting this collective conversation started. I think, um, I think everybody's going to want to uh, participate in it because of how forward-looking this really uh, is as an opportunity. And I'd like to end with one request of the public, if I may, and that is just if you were involved in prior efforts or conversations with any of these entities and you are interested in um, assisting, then please put your, you know, put, send an email to volunteer at, uh, at Port Jeff. And, um, and if you were part of that working group and you have a body of content that could help us and maybe save us some time in terms of researching the history of all of this, I, I, we'd all be very grateful if uh, you could share that out with us. And um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share the update with you. I look forward to sharing future updates on a regular basis. And, uh, and you know, open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Zena. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, when do you meet? Are they public? Are you open them up to the public? Can anybody listen in and attend? Um, how do you feel that uh, National Grid is responding to this interest that, that the village and the, the, the working group is paying to, to this issue? Okay, so there's a couple of questions there. <laughs> um, so first, National Grid uh, has been incredibly welcoming. I've been on site now a couple of times. Uh, we have probably five people that we are working with now. Did we broker the first visit of we, the Port Jefferson School District to the power We plant? did. Okay. We did. I was right. there for that. And it was really exciting to see, you know, that many students, many of whom have an engineering aspiration. Right, but I what I think NetGrid did really, really well was um, explain the breadth of opportunities that are in this industry. I mean, I I work in the industry, and for me, the labor that keeps that plant running or is um, supporting no. sort of the the grid that's out there, so the work that PSE and G does, et cetera, um, you know, okay. that represents for me, a huge opportunity for people who are in the middle class to maintain an income that allows them to build a house, 
support a family um, without necessarily having to, to go to graduate school and do a doctorate, right? I mean, basic high school education, engineering, and labor unions, I think, are really critical to this effort. NACRID has been super welcoming. They're helping us navigate our way through the organization. Um, Tom Proverture was, was instrumental in making some of those connections. And, uh, and they were proactive in reaching out to us as a village, right? Mm -hmm. You made, I think, Mayor, you made the first introduction that, that I sat in on. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's not grid. LIPA, um, we have, as you know, some board connections, but I think we now need to move into who are the decision makers? Do they have a government liaison that, that we can start interfacing with? And, and we're working through all of those items. Uh, NYSERDA, we've, we've met with on numerous occasions. In fact, we now also have revitalized uh, our participation as a village in the clean energy, um, clean energy Communities program, which Port Jeff was already participating in, but, um, but you know, given some of the turnover, had, had sort of fallen by the wayside. So we're back in that strongly and um, and they've been great to work with also and also just by virtue of those conversations we're getting um, introduced to other folks who are who are doing things like providing funding for any any of the research that needs to be done about the economic impact of actually shutting the plant here in Port Jeff so we're finding lots of pockets of funding that ultimately will help us um, have a data-based, realistic conversation about what the future could be. What's the plan? Um, Thank you. What does it mean? Ah, that was the other question. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we meet twice a month right now. They are virtual meetings. We do them over Zoom. Um, we leverage an AI to take all the notes, et cetera. So we don't post the, the working session, but I do do a status that I send out to, uh, to the mayor on, uh, on a regular basis in terms of uh, what we do. So um, there is an open invitation to participate in the working group, but I just want to make you aware that uh, it's, it's not a, hey, I just want to come in here. It's, I'm going to put you to work. You're going to be making phone calls. You're going to be doing research. So um, just know that also. So there is a government person at LIPA, and I'll send you the information. Um, I'm glad to hear that the clean energy communities is uh, continuing on. I know uh, I had submitted a resolution last early summer that helped get us closer to getting one of their grants. What is the status now of, uh, has the village been awarded? Any of the, the grant things? So the way the program works, it's a point-based system. So one of the actions that was taken originally got us to a certain level of points. There is a list now of additional actions. You get points awarded, and when you reach a certain level of points, you get a grant, right? This is, and this is, this is really good grant money because it's, there's no matching, right? It's, it's an award. Um, but you do have to make the upfront investments in certain things. Now, some of them are actually not um, very costly, or in fact, they may be things that we're already doing, like the fixed asset um, inventory. If we provide that to them, that is that gets us like fifteen hundred points. It's it's material. Um, so there are things like that, and then doing a building assessment of the buildings that we have in the village. Uh, that, obviously, there's a cost for, right? We have to hire somebody to do it, but um, but that's another stage of points. So there's a list. Um, I, I don't wanna speak for the mayor, but um, so I, uh, I met with, with, um, with Stephen and, and um, and and we uh, and, and clerk and we had uh, a conversation about what next steps are to ensure that there are people that this is assigned to in the village that can take this forward. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Zena. All right, our next uh, presentation is a summary of findings and recommendations from the Port Jefferson Village Election Task Force. And just a quick summary background on how this got started. Um, this was a, an independent task force of volunteers who were uh, selected, self-selected, and um, sort of brought together um, at the request of uh, uh, Trustee Casse, myself, following some an incident that occurred, not an incident, but a, a decision that was made, um, a board decision that was made prior to the election last year um, it, at a working session meeting, at a work session meeting, it, at which it was uh, it was put up for resolution off the agenda to um, extend the terms of the length of the terms of the mayor and the trustees to four years. Was it trustees as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it was it was unanimously approved. Um, and then there was some second thoughts about it. So then it was unanimously rescinded because it was agreed that um, the residents should have a say in in that type of decision. And then um, Trustee Casse sort of spearheaded the task force or the work, the task force to, um, for an independent group to review everything about the elections and make some recommendations similar to what happened in the village of Southampton mm -hmm. earlier that year. Um, and to, to kind of use that as a model, but also this had not been done. I don't know if it had ever been done. So it was a welcome um, it was a welcome initiative, and we we're uh, grateful for your findings and your recommendations. Um, we'd like to now invite you to to talk to the board about mm -hmm. them. Well, first, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a little hoarse. Um, I want to thank Kathleen McLean. Kathleen, this is Kathleen McLean, thank you. representing the election committee, and I'm happy to say we're all here tonight. Um, and I also like to follow up on what Zena said. Um, it was a terrific experience, this volunteer. This is like, I think, the first committee I was on. And I met, I've made friends. And I, it's just been, it was wonderful. The most wonderful thing about it was how everybody, such a group of intelligent people that even when I thought I knew what direction I wanted to go on in two or four years or term limits or not, someone always came up with an argument that I went, Oh, so the fact that we managed to come up with three unanimous decisions out of the four questions was really extraordinary because everybody made such wonderful arguments. So the three questions that we were tasked with initially were, one, should there be term limits for mayors and trustees? Two, should terms be extended from two to four years? And three, should the election date be changed from June to March? Organically, on our own, as we were having our discussions, um, we came up with uh, a fourth question, which was, should the number of trustees be increased from four to six? And interestingly enough, that was the question <laughs> that we could not agree on. And it provoked the most interesting uh, discussions. And, um, and we're still kind of, I think, thinking about it, wrestling with it. But it was a really interesting question, and we really felt it was important um, to add that. So the recommendations that we um, came up with were on term limits. I think I'd like to maybe read the, um, the recommendation in full, if that's all right, just the recommendation part. So on term limits, we came up with no term limits for trustees. And the consensus was not to impose them the possible negative unintended consequences of term limiting village trustees, we felt, far outweighed any perceived benefits. Uh, and it should be noted that much of the empirical evidence regarding term limited officials has mostly focused on state legislators. But we felt that the village, uh, that it was more important to, um, for, the, for, the, for the village to have that, if, if they wanted to keep voting someone in, they could. If someone was doing a good job as a trustee. However, on mayor, as an executive position, um, we wrote, since the power of the mayor's office can be more impactful than that of a trustee, we recommend limiting Port Jefferson's mayor 
to a total of eight years, whether that be four two-year terms, which we recommend, or two four-year terms, and that can be consecutive or interrupted. <clears throat> now, a term limit placed upon a mayor's public service can potentially maintain a healthy balance between change and the status quo. Allocating a mayor a maximum of eight years may be deemed to be fair and reasonable because a mayor after serving eight years may then choose to run as a trustee, thereby retaining their influence on matters in the village and also um, limit, eliminating any negative consequences of being term limited because the voters still can vote for that person. Um, so that's where we came down on that. And um, oh, it'll pop up, it'll come back to me. So that was on the, <clears throat> the term limits. And on term lengths, uh, the consensus and recommendation was that they should remain at the current two-year terms for both mayor and trustees. We feel that in conjunction with not recommending term limits for trustees, it's important to follow the sentiments of one of our founding fathers, Roger Sherman, who maintained that shorter terms with the hopes to preserve the good behavior of rulers. The task force also urges that any future board of trustees defer any question of term lengths to village residents in the form of a referendum. And of course, we made a note in our introduction that any of these changes, of course, would have to be a subject to a public referendum, which is how we got here in the first place. Um, the third question was <clears throat> whether we should um, move the current June election date to another time in March. And apparently it is legal. Villages get to decide that on their own. Um, and most of the village, we did do some, uh, a lot of research, and it seemed most of the villages did use June, but several of them um, had March and one um, small village, Daring Harbor, I think it was, they had it in May. They're a sea seaside town, and they have more residents in at the end of May, so they did it right before Memorial Day. So the unanimous consensus was to hold the elections and keep them in June. Um, in addition to the positives that we mentioned, which were the good weather, longer days, people able to pretend meet and greets, having them outside, the Port Jefferson has a tradition of swearing in the mayor and trustees amid the 4th of July celebration. Uh, and the inaugural ceremony occurs outdoors on the steps of Village Hall. And there's the fire, the fire department. There's the parade and the fire department party. So um, this was the first year I attended it, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> now, the last um, the question of four to six trustees, <clears throat> there was wide agreement that, oh, I see. That was my, um, there were so many pros and cons, we didn't have one unanimous recommendation. Um, we, it was, it was, we, the issues we considered about that were how much work the trustees have being liaisons in the, in the village. And our research uh, uncovered that there's really only four departments that are required to have liaisons, and that's the public works, buildings, finance, and public safety. But of course, our, our, our trustees handle a lot more than that. So we were concerned maybe sometimes there's too many meetings uh, for the, uh, trustees to attend, and maybe having more trustees would help with that load. Um, but then another wonderful point was made that you don't need, the liaison does not have to be a trustee, and in many cases, they just have to be a a concerned or educated person in the village who knows a little bit about that particular um, department. And that they all they have to do is give their report. They need to be appointed, but then they just need to give a report to the village. So a trustee does not have to be the liaison to every single department. Um, so this was a question, excuse me, that generated the liveliest conversations. And you know, we have our governor's term limited and Usually, and often cases, executives can be term limited in certain states. So I think that was, um, when we pulled those people, that was one of the findings that we considered when we made the report. Mayor, my only fear, hearing the recommendation, and it's, and it's a good one, um, good recommendation, um, did, the, did the committee consider voting blocks? For what I mean 
is I ran for mayor as part of a team, right? I had a ticket, let's oh, we say. Did. And now part of our internal discussions as a ticket was you'll be me of the mayor the first year, you'll be mayor the second year, oh, I'll yeah. be mayor the third year, and now these three people controlled the village for the next 30 years. Which is why I believe term limits for one, and just, just my opinion yeah, as yeah, council, yeah. having 20 some years experience in local villages and elections, term limits for all are term limits for none. That's just my opinion, but I don't vote. There's just one but other that, thing to that, That's just a concern that I had that on paper it looks great, but again, people are people. And some people are, I'm not going to say dubious, but some people have agendas. And like-minded people usually run together. At least in my experience in villages, it's very rare that it's vote for me. It's usually vote for me, me, and me, me, her, and him, or whatever. Um, and under this theory, the three of us, whoever those us are, could manipulate this village and be in control of it for a number of years outside of the eight, if there's no term limits for trustee, literally 30 years. Well, I think the greatest uh, form of term limit is the voters. And, and if the voters are seeing that there's manipulation, a lack of transparency, they don't like the direction the village is going, they're not going to vote in him, her, or the other uh, as part of this block because, you know, it's not everyone is so plugged in as the people who are showing up today and tuning in. But, um, you know, there's there are voices out there. And so I, I believe in the power of the democracy that we exists. We, we actually, I'm sorry, Drew. You oh, no, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> that was a question that we considered strongly under the four to six trustees. Um, there's a section in that last question about coalition governing. And we kept going back and forth with that. So we, instead of even putting it in as a recommendation, we put it in just under further considerations. And if I just read that, uh, the concern with coalition governing, so like running as a, a three-part mayor and two trustees on a team, um, that was a big topic, but the task force was unable to come to a consensus on whether or not the issue would be alleviated by adding two more trustees. Under the current four trustee framework, a coalition between two of them and the mayor can consistently control decision making, particularly if the terms are not staggered. And under the six trustee model, a coalition would require at least three trustees and the mayor. But the task force couldn't agree on which scenario would make the forming of these coalitions more likely, although we did agree that strict coalition governing was not in the best interest of the village. So that just came under that last question, but I can see what you're saying about under the term, term limits, et cetera. <clears throat> One thing I was going to raise under the term limits is something that the county ran into, I think, two cycles ago. That is, is your term limit you serve that term, you're limited, then you're out, or you could sit out a term and run again. Well, that's the, uh, whether it's consistent or interrupted. But if you have a total of eight years, you could serve two years, be away for a few years, and come back for another two years. You know, so you could have that in that interrupted kind of um, Drew, is your question, because I, I know other term limits, including <coughs> yeah. some I've drafted myself, wherein um, it's a 10-year term, right. you could sit out for four, and then it resets your clock to run for another term. Correct. That's what happened in the county. I think a county legislature, late legislator sat out, attempted to run again, and the court said no. But I don't know if that decision would be applicable to the village. Well, is that something that can be clarified in language? Sure. Yes, it's absolutely. A, it, it, That's why I raised that, it. Right, that was right, a right, drafting yeah, problem. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Um, maybe clerk or uh, council. When when is the deadline? If is the board looking to have a discussion about a 2024 potential referendum, or is that deadline for referendums passed and this would be a discussion for 2025's ballot? That's I'm just a question for our um, election officer. Okay. I don't, I don't believe that the deadline has passed, but I would have to check with my comp. Great, thank you. I can tell you we're probably close. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I want to say nine, 75 <coughs> days prior to the third Tuesday of June. Mm -hmm. is generally when village cut, village election law kind of cuts off, which I also believe is our next meeting, if I have my math right. And um, Kathleen, did the group research um, term limits and what other villages on Long Island uh, yes. and in New York yes, do there? Yes, they did. Um, does anybody else? Who, who did the term limits? 
Art and, and Michael. Do you want to? Because they, they're the ones who did the research on that. We each had, different, we each had a different question. What's the matter, Art? <laughs> Uh, I want to be respectful to our <laughs> village attorney. Uh, thank you. First of all, and we should all have mutual respect, and I believe that civility is the foundation of good government. Uh, term limits are fascinating because there is a, well, I, the best way I could describe it is a bifurcation in this country. 90% plus people who uh, live in this country advocate for term limits. And at, at a point of such division in the country where people on one side of the aisle think one thing and one side of the aisle think something else, it's quite remarkable. We actually have consensus on this. Now here's the irony, which I think our village attorney might not know, is that the consensus among political scientists is as overwhelming, that term limits are absolutely dysfunctional for reasons stated in the report. It's, it's not even close. We're talking 95% consensus that term limits over time, and I'm not just talking in the United States. I'm saying this goes global. Research, uh, one study I saw involved 40 countries across the world. It gets to the point of coming down to essentially human nature, that when you take the voter out of the equation, uh, people who are elected tend to behave a bit differently and not for the better. I'm confused. So you're saying term limits are good or bad? I'm saying people want them. Me too. Overwhelmingly. Me too. But the people who do the social science, the does, experts, add up. agree that they're not good. Agreed. So it's hard to say to the people, we know you like this, but it's not good for you. Uh, 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 <laughs> if you are familiar with the legendary uh, concert promoter Bill Graham, uh, he had this wonderful statement of saying, I tried to give the people not what they want, but what they should want. And I think that's the best way of sort of encapsulating this. So I, I think you're making an interesting point in terms of being an attorney, but if you delve into the political science, it's, it's there and it's, you can't argue it. It's, Understand what I said. I'm a firm believer of term limits for all or for none. Okay. That's what I said. That's my, just my opinion for reasons I stated because I believe holding the mayor to a different standard as the person who, although the responsible one and the one who chairs the meeting, to a different standard than the people who without them, the trustees, the mayor can basically be neutralized and completely dysfunctional, creates another level of problem. In my ex actual experience. Okay. Uh, you know, it's sort of interesting uh, in that as I was writing it, I came up with the idea that it's only reasonable to term limit the mayor because the mayor can come back as trustee, which has happened in other villages, but never in this incorporated village's history. Sometimes I get the feeling that the mayor in this village is sort of more exalted than other municipalities, though I, I like to believe... I, <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> Though I like to believe the current mayor might be an exception who, who would welcome coming back if you had an issue you wanted to delve into. And interestingly enough, uh, I did do some brief research. The only United States president to come back as a member of Congress, John Quincy Adams, president number six. And he, that was during the 1830s. And he took a very important stance against, uh, he was an abolitionist. And uh, that was a sad decade, uh, the Trail of Tears, if what we did horrible things to the Native Americans under Andrew Jackson. So the fact that John Quincy Adams came back uh, and did that was fantastic. I guess his father was John Adams, who was the second president as well. And that was the only example in presidential history where a president came back under different circumstances as a member of Congress. So it's rare, but uh, I think it's healthy. And I should also mention, I was born and raised in Garden City, and from my recollection, I don't know if it's still the case, but they elect eight trustees, then choose among themselves which one of the eight will serve as mayor. And uh, 
I don't know if they rotate annually or how they do it now, but it's another example of the mayor not necessarily being as exalted. And I'll throw in one last case because uh, to the dismay and consternation of uh, some of my fellow uh, committee members, I love talking about the example of Scarsdale. Now, now I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, I can't see behind you. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you know how, why that's unique? Okay, okay, because you, you claimed expertise, and um, it's, it's fascinating. But to be fair, I claimed expertise, like what I claimed was in my experience of representation. Okay. You know, I actually like you and respect you. So here's the thing, and this is why I brought it up, not that I was advocating we do it in Port Jeff, but I was bringing it up as an example of mindfulness, something that's so counterintuitive that it kind of gives you the outside looking in perspective. For over a hundred years in, in Scarsdale, and it's important to say they've done it for that long because it leads you to believe, say as a sociologist would say, it's functional. They elect 12 citizens each year to a citizens nominating committee. So in total, they have 36 citizens. Those citizens then choose who will be the mayor, who will be the trustees, and I think who would be the village justice. Granted, you can, if you garner 100 votes, get on the ballot, but in essence, it's the 36 citizens who are elected who choose those people in an ongoing basis for over a century, and they continue to do it, so it leads you to believe it's functional. The whole purpose is, and this is amazing, it's non or apolitical, so you will have a mayor potentially come into power with nobody in the community knowing what your agenda or platform is. Sounds super <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's the whole point. It works for them. It might not work for us, but it's the outside looking in perspective because government doesn't have to be as narrow as we might think. There, it's just there are so many possibilities, and we don't want to limit ourselves. And I should just, since I'm talking now, uh, uh, two footnotes and not talking about the findings. And I think it's important to put on public record. Mayor Shepro, uh, neither Mayor Shepro nor any member of her administration intervened or interceded or tried to influence this process. Uh, it's important to put that on public record that this was totally hands off in isolation and that nobody's political agenda or personal views got baked into this cake, if you will. And the second footnote I put in there, we talked about volunteerism just as Zena did, and as the mayor introduced this group, she very aptly described how it came to be. Uh, an important point, I think, is that when Mayor Shepro took over, you had that web page uh, asking citizens, the way I would phrase it, is to take on the mantle of citizenship. And this was a committee of volunteers that I believe was ultimately very functional. Uh, I think we coalesced to be a, a critical mass of critical thinkers. So what I'm saying is you can look at our committee and say it validates and affirms what Mayor Shepro did asking for volunteers as opposed to appointees. Not that I'm saying all appointees are bad, but I'm saying under most circumstances, I believe volunteers might be more passionate and more devoted to the task. So, so, on, so on that note. All of that without disrespecting you. Thank you. <laughs> You're Irish, are you not? I am. Okay. Happy uh, St. Patty's. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any question? Any other questions for the committee, or our attorney, or our election officer? I just want to express my gratitude to these folks. I uh, I can see from the the depth of work and uh, knowing many of them and the depth of conversation that uh, they like to engage in that it was a lot of time and a lot of thoughtfulness and a lot of research. And uh, you know, again, as uh, Mr. Epps said, being an independent body uh, really brings a lot of confidence to these decisions and the further discussion of the board. So thank you. OK.
Okay, now we can uh, launch into our board discussions. Yes, Sylvia? It's to summary and findings, recommendations. Do we need to continue discussing that? I think so. Uh, moving on. Yes, Jessica? No, just to put an, a button on that so we'll be made aware of when that deadline is so that I guess I'm just curious to know if we're wanting to uh, discuss this before a deadline or um, we don't want to rush any decisions. I, we learned our lesson last time, no rushing decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just um, don't know if we're going to have the opportunity this year or not. I will um, advise as soon as possible. And I'm looking forward to putting the clerk under some new pressure. Uh, just on that, and since we're talking about elections, uh, is there, uh, Sylvia, I don't want to take this out of order or anything, but I'll just ask you because we're on this topic. Has there been any feedback um, from Board of Elections on whether or not voting machines will be available for the June election? That will not happen until early April. I will know in early April? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay, monthly reports. I will start. I just have a few items uh, to update the board on. Uh, the clerk and I met with uh, representative from Maggio's um, carting service uh, based on recent uh, complaints about um, a, a, uh, an increase in the rates. Um, and it was a very productive meeting. We learned a lot. Um, very engaging representative from the company came in and explained everything, uh, everything we wanted to know about carting and trash. Uh, we learned in about an hour's time. Um, and, and there's more, I'm sure. Uh, so what, we, what we've asked is if we can, um, and, and, he, and he offered it several times uh, for any residents to take a tour of the facilities, one of the facilities. They have one in Yapank that we're looking at, um, touring, taking our 15-passenger van and heading over to um, the station in Yapank. And I think it'll be a very educational field trip for residents and for, for the board members that are interested in, in going. Um, and we have invited him to attend our work session in April to address the board and talk through some of these things. So um, we found it so interesting and I'm just absolutely positive that the rest of the residents will and the rest of the board will as well. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, big news, and I don't want to steal your thunder, uh, Trustee Giuliano, but I'll talk about this real quick, is that the uh, um, Department of Parks, the trucks and the trailer have now been relocated up to the uh, Department of Public Works at 88 North Country Road um, on solid ground, and they're in the process of being set up and hooked up and, uh, and stabilized by the... Um, Superintendent of Highways working with the, the Superintendent of Public Works. So I'm Superintendent of Highways working with the Parks Director. So uh, we're very excited to see that trailer move out of the park in Salt Meadow. I am anyway. Don't look at it just yet because um, it's very muddy and it needs to be graded and regraded and seeded and, and whatnot. But uh, it'll, it'll, it's certainly opening up that space. And uh, we've heard a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, we have, we're having discussions with a local artist who we're hoping to introduce as an artist in residence in the coming weeks. Uh, someone who we are um, in the process of setting up an exhibit with. Uh, the artist's name is Dino Rinaldi. He's a Port Jefferson High School graduate. Uh, he is a professional. Uh, he had been working in professional advertising for his entire career in New York City. Uh, but an art and, and, not but, and an artist on the side. So he has uh, engaged with us to talk about what it would be like to be an artist in residence. You might have seen him uh, set up his easel painting along the streets of, of uh, Port Jefferson. Um, he's, he's, he'll be out tomorrow. If you, uh, He'll be by the Red Building and down by the Village Center, I believe. Um, so anyway, what he is uh, working with us on for this exhibit, which is so far slated for June 9th through the 30th in the Village Center on the first level is a, um, an exhibit with a, a reception slash fundraiser for the uh, 1776 whaleboat build. 
to continue their progress uh, in funding the, the building of their well boat. Uh, details yet to be uh, codified and, and solidified, but it's very exciting because um, he's a very gener generous individual and he just loves Port Jefferson. So follow him on Facebook at Dino Rinaldi Art and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but so we're looking forward to introducing an artist in residence. Uh, speaking of uh, LISEC and the whale boat build, our grant writer, Nicole Christian, worked with LISEC to uh, put together a grant application to the Gardner Foundation uh, for additional funding to support the costs that it will take to complete that build, uh, to buy a trailer to transport the, the, the whale boat, and to uh, buy a... Um, uh, cover for the whale boat in, in lieu of in initially uh, building a permanent structure to house the whale boat in. So the, they're saying that the whale boat might be done by uh, the end of the year. I'm no, not sure. Don't want to push them. They're doing a great job. If you if you have an opportunity to uh, when the last time you've been down there to take a look at it, but you can see the whale boat's really taking shape right now. Um, then. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the, the new Board of Governors at the Port Jefferson Country Club. They're meeting very regularly in this initial uh, uh, time frame of being established um, in January. Uh, they've met at least five or six times and they're making great progress working with the general manager, the superintendent, and the golf pro um, to make some needed changes up at the Country Club, including a new uh, bunker renovation project, uh, which is currently underway. Um, so we're very excited and w and grateful to their volunteerism and working as as a working group. They're they're looking you know deeply at the operations of the country club and trying to help uh, move it along uh, the golf programs at the country club, and giving their feedback and ideas and recommendations and expertise from a professional standpoint. Um, and when I say professional, I mean bringing their professional expertise into some of these recommendations and decision-making processes. And then finally, I just wanted to give a major shout out to, um, uh, he's not here today, but uh, Code Enforcement Chief Andy Owen and also the Port Jefferson, Port Jefferson Fire Department for their late shift efforts to um, keep people safe in Port Jefferson when there was severe flooding due to tidal issues during the, the rainstorm that we all knew was happening on Saturday night. Um, we were updating our, our social media pages in real time, probably right around 11.30, 12.15, and then again at 1.30. Um, two things, two Facebook pages, the Village Facebook page and then the Code Enforcement page. So I want to give a shout out to, to Chief Owen for doing that while he was out <clears throat> in the field working with his, the code enforcement officers to set up barricades and direct traffic up until midnight because then they get off. But um, I just wanted to, I, I know there was some questions about why didn't we sub send out a, an alert that night? Why didn't we use the Port Jeff alert system to tell people stay away from downtown? Um, it's flooded. Uh, it was really, it was 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, so we didn't want to wake people to tell them not to get up and go downtown. <laughs> so um, that was sort of a strategic decision and calculated, uh, um, but we did use the best resources that we had at, on hand not, not to interrupt uh, the REM portion of people's sleep. So that said, we, we really do look at <clears throat> the code enforcement official page if you haven't signed up for that page it's a it's you have to you have to submit your interest in being on that page and and, and having access to that page uh, chief owen lets is the person who administers that page he lets everybody in um, but also the port jefferson village page they interact very closely together uh facebook and and um instagram so follow and share and let us know if you think that we are or could do a better job, but also um, understand that there is always uh, strategic and, and um, uh, thinking that goes into when we send out a Port Jeff alert and when and why. So um, just wanted to put that out there. And that's my report.
Next up is uh, Trustee Giuliano, Department of Public Works and the Parks Department. Thank you. Um, just to working. Okay. To piggyback a little bit on what you said as far as the rain, um, as far as the DPW goes, they had two snow events, and I just want to congratulate both the Department of Public Works, the Parks Department, and all the village employees worked together and cooperated to successfully and efficiently clean and clear village roads and village sidewalks. Um, their collaborative effort and dedication have once again ensured that the safe and efficient passage of vehicles and pedestrians throughout our village, despite facing challenges of weather conditions, snow, they had many broken down, um, uh, not broken down trucks, but they, they had issues with, with some of the trucks and some of, and some of the plows. Um, they de the departments demonstrated exemplary teamwork and professionalism, and I want to thank every single um, employee of the village for doing that. Uh, the unwavering commitment to excellence is commendable and greatly appreciated by everybody on this board and I'm sure everybody that, uh, that lives in the village. So thank you very much for that. Um, as the mayor said, the Parks Department is in the process of more. They've, they've moved over to their offices over to 88 North Country Road. So they'll all be uh, in one area, which makes for better cooperation uh, among all the different departments. DPW supervisor is reviewing the contracts concerning snow removal, Leaf tr and tree leaf and tree cleanup and garbage disposal. So he's going to be looking at those, uh, speaking with uh, with Sylvia about and see how we can uh, can get those contracts going. New signs for the country club are being fabricated and they'll be delivered once completed. Again, showing cooperation between the uh, different departments. Steve Gallagher, Steve Gallagher, the DPW supervisor, coordinated with Suffolk County Water for various road opening locations to work on water means. Loot those locations include various sites on Old Post Road West, Liberty Avenue, William Street, Jones Avenue. Um, so if you're seeing some work done, if you're seeing the roads being being torn up in those areas, you know, have a little patience with them. Sees working closely with uh, Suffolk County Water to ensure that the roads are properly repaired, properly opened, and then repaired and paved as soon as, as soon as they can. There was a little bit of a flu epidemic going through DPW. It hindered a lot of tests going on. One person got it, and they're working in such close working conditions that they passed it on to other people. So they had a little bit of, a, uh, of an epidemic going on in the DPW. Uh, I think that's all taken care of now, and everybody is – I know Steve was out for a while. Everybody's hopefully back to, uh, to good, good health and good working condition. Uh, with the heavy rain event that we had, they were clearing drains before the before the rain event, so that uh, to prevent what as much flooding as could be prevented. Um, as far as the parks update, they worked with DPW again, snow clearing during the two snow events. Um, they removed and stored all the um, ice festival decorations. They are in the process, and they've I, I don't know if they've completed it yet, but they're in the process of replacing the siding on the bathroom at Rocket Ship Park. Uh, it was starting to rot, so they were replacing the siding there. They completed a fabrication of over two dozen uh, safety barricades that will be used throughout the village. Repair, and they repaired the broken cable lines um, on the walkway by the big chair over at the Hawk Front Park. 20 yards of riprap rock, riprap rock, which is not easy to say delivered to, to the drive leading down West Beach to slow the erosion on the west side of the road. So they, they um, got the rocks put in there, and hopefully that will keep some of the, uh, the erosion from coming down onto the, onto the roadway, down to West Beach. Uh, safety nets will be installed on the Joe Erland Field on Carolina Avenue before the start of the softball season, which starts April 15th. And that safety net will be put up to prevent the balls from going onto the street and onto neighboring properties. Uh, the spring hanging baskets will be installed by the beginning of May, by, by Mother's Day. As far as the Parks of Rec Committee, the committee reviewed the code change recently approved by the Board of Trustees and assigned the beginning terms to members to stagger the three-year term expiration dates. They also welcomed two new members who could become alternates for the committee. I will give those, those names to Clerk Perillo for acceptance at our, at our next board meeting. Um, there's a number of kayaks, paddle boards, et cetera, that were stored, that were used at the, on the kayak racks and were just abandoned. So the committee is recommending that we 
where we hold an auction to clear the storage, but right now they're all being stored in the storage bin that's down at the beach. So the committee is recommending that we hold some sort of a um, of an auction to get get rid of all those things so they can actually use the, the bin for storage of of village equipment. Um, so yeah, Sylvia, I don't know if you know you can speak to Dave or something like that and is, see if we can coordinate something like that. Is there like a statute of limit? as far as the, What's currently in the bin these are these are kayaks and paddle boards that residents uh, signed up to put on our racks don't we have contact information for they, these and folks? they've been contacted and for whatever reason either they no longer live there they, they cannot be contacted or they just uh, we don't want it just we, we have to send out like certified mail so I, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what other process to first is, but, take, yeah. take possession of them which we have Yes, right now they're being stored in a... In a Take possession in a legal sense. Oh, okay. Because they left it in our yard. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a, a real... Right. Position, whatever that formula is. Mm -hmm. We can certainly do it. Okay. And the board would then call for the option. Right. Because they, they, had to be, they had to be removed by, I think it was November 1st. And, you know, now we're into March and they we're getting ready to put new ones on there. And, you know, there's a lot that are in the bins that we just want to clear out. I don't know. I, Dave told me I don't. I don't recall. But there, there was a number of them. It was more than just two or three. And there are a couple there that have been there for years, not just this past season, but from seasons past. So, um, the conservancy. We uh, we had a meeting yesterday. Uh, just to give you a heads up, the hill climb is scheduled for August seventeenth. And no, oh, the other issue there was a sign. I guess there's a village historian sign that's missing. I just want to let you know that I guess I'll let Renee know too because the, 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 the sign for the village story at the archive office disappeared. Don't know where it is, but <laughs> um, question: Do we the parking committee? Um, I, I know they had submitted their their report, and uh, you know Andy Freeling spoke to us. But are we going to have any dis further discussions on that, or um, uh, we, we have to set a date? I guess when the meters go back on. Um, there will be endless discussion about okay. parking. Um, we have had some internal uh, evaluation and some, we're, we're actually in the middle of a pilot project right now where we're monitoring the um, and enforcing, like actually enforcing uh, parking along East Main Street, Main Street, and West Broadway um, with our handheld devices. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're really reconciling, Bob, and it's very, it's, there, it's the tip of the iceberg. The report sure. and the recommendations are sort of the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So I think Andy is, is working on setting up a meeting with the parking committee. Has the parking committee stopped meeting? I, I, don't, I, I, I would think that this is a, a process that continues on, and I would like to see the parking committee continue to meet. Um, that said, because there's so much to talk about, sure, absolutely. and there, there's so much data to understand and review that we we haven't been, um, and then there's a lot of interaction between um, the technology that hasn't been working, so we don't have the data because no one's really been looking to make sure that the device technology is actually communicating with each other. So we have a lot of work to do with mm -hmm. parking. I, I think there's a couple of things we can do that the committee recommended off, off you know, to start to start the the, the season, um, but I'm going to hold off on talking and and announcing anything like that because I have nothing to announce. Number one, uh, additional more meetings have to actually happen. So, um, and I would hope to see the parking committee meet again because um, I think as as we go along this process and learn more about how the five different types and maybe more of technology work together hand in hand and haven't been but can be are we monitoring are we are we um enforcing we we'd be making decisions based on information that isn't accurate or that is anecdotal so i believe that there are things that we can do that were presented and recommended in that document uh but we have so much uh, i I, for one, am, am very reluctant to make a decision based on information that isn't thoroughly um, analyzed and, and, and 
um, context provided to what we're, what are we actually looking at here, right? So I'm um, interested, open, engaged, involved, and want to see it work, right? I want to see it work for everybody. I want to see parking, and Michael Mart left, so I want to see parking managed. Uh, you know, it's not about, you know, so exactly. let's, let's just, we'll continue meeting. Um, well, I'll I guess the most pressing is when are we turning the meters back on? Um, I, I guess we have to set that date, right? That we do. Is, it's coming up. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we, should the Board of Trustees either individually or collectively come up with a set of questions for the Parking Committee to address to further our conversations? If there's, if there are questions post the discussion and post the conversation, the, um, uh, the packet that we were given that we have, is that a productive way to continue a collaboration between the parking committee and the board to try to get to some sense of next steps? Andy's report kind of covers a lot of this, but um, it doesn't say when uh, meters will be um, turned on. Um, so, and I know the committee uh, recommended that parking meters turn on at a one at a particular time. I'm not again. I'm not. I'm not prepared to say that there has been a, an agreement to to either April 1st, which it has been March 1st. It's been eight, or March 15th, April 1st. Right. But, all over the place. Yeah. So um, again, I, I see the the chair of the committee in the room, and with, respectfully, I, I would say let's continue meeting and talking and um, getting to the best uh, solutions, grabbing off the low-hanging fruit, coming up with a date when meters should uh, be turned on. But I don't think there is consensus on that right now. So I know we're coming up to April 1st. It's three weeks away or right. so, right? So we have, to, we have to get a move on. What would you say, Stephen? I would say that this Excuse me. Because of the budgetary implications that some of these decisions have, that these decisions need to be made and these discussions need to be had before uh, the typical start date, which would be April 1st. Um, I have to have a budget stamped in tentative by the 20th. Um, we have our bud tentative. 20th of? March. Yeah. Our preliminary budget hearing is April 10th. Uh, the budget has to be adopted, uh, will be uh, put up for adoption on the 24th. So we need to get a move on, uh, you know, to have those, you know, if those decisions that are going to impact revenue. And so following up on that, as you prepare the budget, your um, anticipated uh, revenue from parking is taking into consideration that parking is, uh, turns on, the metered parking turns on in? April 1st. That's how, because that's the information that is historically what has happened. So, so I, I spoke with Andy today, and I believe he's trying, he's in the process of setting up a meeting. Uh, so we now understand the urgency of that meeting is to happen well before March 20th. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for asking that, Bob. Sure. Absolutely. I just wanted to make sure it's stays in everybody's mind we, it's something that you know the, the, the committee got together and, and spoke about i know andy's been talking with them it's something that we have to keep on discussing as well and come to some uh, conclusions with uh one one last thing uh friday night was the historical society dinner um it was hosted or the, the, the historical society hosted uh author bill blyer who's in at its annual dinner, um, Bill gave a lecture on the sinking of the steamboat Lexington, which was really fascinating. It was a boat that sunk in 1840 in Long Island Sound. Um, I think, I think it was four people, Rebecca, Survived. correct? Four people. There were four, four survivors um, from that uh, shipwreck, and the site of the sinking is across from Port Jefferson Harbor. So Bill's approach, both Rebecca and I, we had the opportunity of sitting with him at the dinner. Uh, about placing some sort of commemorative sign, plaque, or, or something, some sort of history about the uh, the sinking of the ship. So uh, we're going to be scheduling a Zoom meeting, and we'll get some more information, and we'll report back to the to the board on that.
but it was a fascinating. He wrote a book, and I, I bought the book. I, I started the book. It was a fascinating uh, lecture that he gave, and you know, he, I think he spoke for forty-five minutes. He, he probably could have spoke for another hour and a half. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> and thank you for sharing the information about it. And uh, very, very interested in in learning more yeah, about it and following the developments there. Yeah, I think it's a it's going uh, has great potential to be another historical uh, uh, marker, and you know, both to commemorate lives lost and also uh, you know deepen the history you know the the um, the way that Port Jefferson is always and always will embrace its history so and the lives saved and the, li the lives saved. those are wild stories yeah and that's my report all right thank you thank you Bob um, trustee Laux <laughs> we can see him I don't know if I'm sure the rest of the can hear you, Stan. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. It's amazing, huh? Uh, I have a number of announcements from the uh, recreation department and also a couple from the schools. Uh, our ice skating has ended for the season. Uh, as of February 25th, the village portion of revenue from skating as reported by Renee, was $104,860.76, a nice source of revenue. Uh, farmer's market, if, if anyone wants a spot for the farmer's market, the applications are due now. Uh, they can email uh, rlemmerman at portjeff.com to get the particulars in finding a spot for your business or whatever you want to do at the farmer's market. Uh, our beaches are going to open on June 22nd, and that will be with lifeguards. Uh, we're still accepting applications for lifeguards, counselors, and tennis assistants. Uh, we still have a few openings. Uh, all of the spring and summer programs have been now listed on our website. Uh, we have programs in tennis, pickleball, fitness, and swimming. Uh, camp applications. Uh, if you have children that are going to or you want to send to camp this summer, it's uh, time to get going on those applications. Uh, those, those spots fill up very quickly. Uh, a couple of announcements I want to make from the schools. Uh, at the last meeting, I announced that uh, we had two students that uh, scored the perfect score in the SAT. Uh, this time, I want to give a little credit to some of the athletes from the local high school. Um, we have a number of them. We have... Uh, Colin Vite and Brian Somerset, who qualified for the county swim championships. Uh, we have Frank D'Elia and Nick Rodriguez, who also they qualified for the county wrestling championships. Uh, we have five students, additional five students, who uh, were all county champions. Uh, in track, we have Alexis Jacobs and Evan Monahan. And in wrestling, we have three county champs, uh, Chase Davis, Chris Lawton, and Preston Bidencamp. Uh, those students are to be congratulated. I think it's pretty wonderful that we have that number of students, uh, and they deserve a lot of credit. Um, there's been some questions about the track meet uh, that's held uh, over at the school. Uh, Adam was supposed to meet with Andrew. I don't know if he met with him yet or not. Uh, once he meets with Andrew, our chief, uh, Adam said that he was going to share the entire plan with us so that we can pass that out to the community, uh, that plan would 
would include the buses and parking and uh, how the athletes are going to get up to the track, whether or not the buses are going to be allowed to go up there the way they were last year or not. So I'm waiting to hear back from Adam. He said he would get back to me as soon as he uh, met with our chief and went over those plans. That's Adam uh, Gerard, the... Um, yes, the athletic director okay. over at the uh, high school. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention, I know they had a, a pretty vigorous meeting last night at the... Uh, uh, Civic Association in, in regards to questions and answers. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident after talking with the superintendent and the president of the board that once that budget, once their budget is complete, I believe they're open to having some kind of a, an open forum meeting where we can uh, formally sit down and ask questions and, and receive answers to most of those questions. So um, I know last night they had some questions and some of the some of the answers cannot be given, and that was pretty obvious. Um, and that's pretty much my report. I had a little difficulty in getting into this meeting, and I have still got some difficulty hearing uh, some of the speakers. I can hear Lauren very well. I heard Bob very well. Um, I, I can't hear anything that Dave says. I don't know if he's got a mic in front of him or not. But, um, I could say something down. very funny about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Stan, why don't you, uh, when you get off of this, why don't you mute and go to the YouTube and you'll be able to hear all of us probably. I couldn't. Yeah, uh, my wife is sitting over here and she's having difficulty hearing also. I YouTube. don't know if. if yeah. <laughs> Maybe we're too old. Maybe we're too old. I don't know. Uh, she, <laughs> uh, anyway, the weather's down here has been beautiful, and we're enjoying our stay. Um, right. Not that I don't miss all you guys, but uh, uh, we're having a good time. Wish you were Thank here. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, so I believe that uh, turn brings us to Trustee Biondo. Uh, one big announcement um, from the planning board and building and planning is that the kind of for two hearing continues tomorrow in this room at 6 30 p.m. and that's the proposed new apartment buildings up by the train station so that folks who have been following that you might want to either uh, tune into the YouTube channel or uh, come join us here at the meeting tomorrow evening and I think that's just about it yeah Trustee Casse. Thank you. Um, all righty. So uh, regarding the uh, Conservation Advisory Council, we have a new member who's come forward. I, I just got his CV, so I'll be forwarding that to the clerk and the board for consideration of, of adoption at our next meeting. Um, he's John Russell. Uh, he has uh, a lot of passion and um, a lot of experience to bring to the CAC. So we're looking forward to having him on board. Um, the CAC is currently looking at uh, precedent um, for um, limiting or eliminating the use of plastic at village events. Um, uh, Myrna Gordon had presented this concept to the Board of Trustees, and then that was you know, suggested that she come present at a Conservation Advisory Council meeting. So she did so. The CAC was very receptive, and so they're going to look and see what other municipalities have been doing in order to um, uh, look at this both and from, from an internal stance, so um, you know, maybe making an internal policy to say that the, the cups we have for water and, and things like this are no longer plastic but uh, more sustainable material, and then also looking uh, perhaps at precedent of municipalities with function centers like ours at the, um, at the village center where uh, folks signing a contract to have an event would, sit, would commit to using non-plastic materials for, for their events. So um, again, in the research stage of that right now, seeing what uh, is working elsewhere is always the way that we like to do things. Uh, you know, what's, what are people doing? How's it working? I always encourage the CEC members to call, uh, you know, much like the other action committees uh, have done. 
do that thorough research, bring it back. So we're looking forward to that. Um, at their last meeting, uh, um, by suggestion of the mayor, uh, we spent most of the meeting just reviewing the code, the village code uh, section that describes the Conservation Advisory Council and what their duties are. And um, it's for many of the members, some of whom have been on for three or four decades uh, con contiguously, uh, it was even illuminating for them to to see, to be reminded of exactly not just what they're um, charged to be doing, but what their capabilities are. So, uh, you know, we're going to be trying to take the concepts that they want to work on and put them into the framework of the code and then uh, continue with that. Um, I've reached out in hopes of getting the minutes uh, to forward on to uh, the clerk and the board as well, the minutes that were taken at the last meeting, so those can be posted. Um, one concept that has come up is um, we've, you know, Oh, we, for years and years, we talked about composting in the village in different capacities. Uh, but recently, um, one uh, resident had gone to uh, another um, village's farmer's market and saw that they had uh, capacity there for residents to once a week come down and deposit um, compost in bins there, which was then taken away. And so having sort of a central place where folks are already going uh, to, to the market um, could be a concept uh, you know, to to further discuss at the CAC. So that's just a conversation that's uh, the seed has been planted. Um, and so I'll be reporting back uh, to the board, uh, maybe looking to have discussions with Renee and the folks that run the farmer's market to see about, you know, how that might work um, moving forward. But uh, seems like a potentially exciting thing for uh, the spring farmer's market as it moves outside. Um, the tree committee uh, had an exciting month, uh, and I think the the clerk for her assistance. Um, uh, we worked together to put together a quick start grant uh, from Tree City USA, uh, as was the umbrella organization. It's a grant up to a thousand dollars for municipalities like ours who have started to take the steps to become a Tree City USA designation, but aren't there yet. And so it's a, a non-matching grant um, in order to help fund an event uh, that would be the village's first annual Arbor Day celebration um, and tree planting. So uh, the uh, committee members picked a site um, in our beautiful parking lot uh, over uh, by um, Old Fields Restaurant there. And so um, we're there, they've put together this event. We're waiting to hear back from the granting agency, but based on the point system that it's uh, coming through, they feel very confident that this will be uh, something that, that will be done. So we, uh, we will ask you to mark your calendars for April 24th from 5 to 6 p.m. for that event. Uh, so again, it's one of these committees that has come together more recently and the volunteers are very enthusiastic about for their beautifying and also helping uh, mitigate the stormwater issues in our village with these trees. Um, uh, today, um, we there was a group of us who met, uh, Andy Freeling from uh, the planning department, the mayor, the clerk, um, our uh, contractors from uh, Companion Shorting Architects regarding the Depar Department of State Climate Resilience Grant that uh, I've been working on uh, with these folks for about two years now. Um, the The next step uh, that we discussed is to have the, the next project action committee meeting and then move towards a workshop um, in the mid-spring. Uh, so that will be a public workshop. Uh, where uh, the the current state of the the grants work is presented to the public, and the public would be asked to give feedback. So please stay tuned for that date, and uh, you know we're excited to share all that's going on there. Uh, flooding, unfortunately, will continue being on the forefront of everyone's minds, especially um, as the April showers bring May flowers, and also flooding in our village. So um, we're you know continuing to work on that. Um, Continuing to, uh, I was excited to hear that with the Jumpstart grant um, that we have to uh, working towards cleaning the sediment out of the culvert um, that runs from Maple Place to Mill Creek. Um, it's currently anywhere between 25 and 50% full of sediment uh, that's just accumulated from the, the, the runoff uh, from our streets. And so to uh, increase the capacity of the this infrastructure to hold stormwater runoff, uh, clearing this out is going to make it, um, you know, that much more effective. Uh, you know, essentially uh, cleaning out and making it 100% uh, capacity as opposed to uh, 75 to 50 percent. So we're looking forward to uh, to getting the green light to move to RFP on that. So stay tuned there. Um, otherwise, I think that's all I'll report on today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Trustee Biondo asked to update on two other things, so one, one second. Just because they've, they've been discussed before, there's a, there is now a proposed bamboo code referred to the village attorney, as is there a, a mural code. So that something that we're looking at. And if you're interested in seeing everything else that the Building and Planning Board Department is doing, there's a bunch of stuff in the documents that are online. I won't go into all of it, but um, this is stuff that's still um, ingredients in the pot and it's cooking. Very interesting ingredients. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, eclectic, diverse uh, yes. material and when that it comes out, it's going to taste very good. It will, <laughs> I hope. Okay. All right. Uh, Clerk Perillo. Yes, is it your turn? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Coming election, thank you. I am recommending that we institute the concept and the idea of two village voter registration days. The purpose of the village voter registration days is to allow a new village resident or perhaps a village resident who hasn't registered to vote in the village to vote and to do so quickly and easily. The two days would be a Thursday and Saturday prior to the election. That would be the 6th and the 8th. Those dates are prescribed, so they need to be those days from noon to 5 p.m. I don't believe that we've done this in the past. We can, right? Never? Not, right. In, not ever. Not in, at least not in the past 25 years. Yeah, so this is a little bit of an experiment, if you will, if we don't have enough turnout and if maybe people are registering through the Board of Elections and everyone's comfortable with that, then we won't repeat this process again next year, but we can at least have take this opportunity. So people that are registered now, would re they don't have to register twice. That's correct. Right? It's only for people that might not be registered through the county. That's correct. So, so question. Yes. Let's say um, Dave, who doesn't live in Port Jefferson, moves into Port Jefferson, uh, and does he have to register to vote in Port Jefferson, or does his voting registration just transfer? And he's a registered voter in the village of Poquot. The registration should transfer. <laughs> well, the, the, answer is, the, but. the answer is they have to provide proof to the satisfaction of the election officer that they are current residents, which is fairly simple. Okay. Either a change in the driver's license or the deed that they recently moved in, and it would be that determination. Registration day in a lot of other municipalities um, are used when someone's registered to vote elsewhere. For instance, I permanently live in New York City, but I summer in Port Jeff. I could avail myself of registration day for that voting purpose in the local village election. Yeah, and, and just to clarify on that point, when when one moves, uh, their their registration does not automatically move with them. But if they update their driver's license, um, so you have the option then uh, mm -hmm. to to re-register. You can always go online as well um, to to register at your new address because you cannot vote at you know in your election district or mm -hmm. uh, the village if you're not registered so within. So to follow up on what you said, uh, Dave, if you um, summer in Port Jefferson and you decide to register to vote in Port Jefferson, does that mean you cannot vote in your district in New York City? It would take a two, a, two steps at that point. You would register as a as a resident here because you own property, not necessarily just because you crashed here for the weekend. Um, you register during registration day. Most people do it in 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 earlier months. Well, it's prescribed in when is it June? Yes. In in June, and a lot of people who aren't full time residents will registration day and along with registration day, they'll also file their absentee ballot. But, but then they would not be registered to vote in New York City, was, I think, the mayor's question. There is a, there, again, the second affirmative step would be just to, when they go back to the city, to, or wherever they're from, to announce that they're now residents there. It's a unique thing in the village law that allows registration. Right. Mm -hmm. I, that's, that was going to be my question, because I saw some eyebrows that 
when you hear a person mm -hmm. from the city then coming to the village, it's like, oh, they're voting twice, and they're mm -hmm. really not. They're voting once. They're voting once mm -hmm. in the village, but if there but there's no other elections generally in New York City. Right. So it's it's not like they're voting for Congress twice or something. In areas where it's extremely summer residents orientated, is the the genesis of the of the registration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Bell, Bellport. Bellport. Right. now we're under no obligation to hold these village voter registration days. Yeah. Okay. So. J just for my own edification, I just want to super clear. So they are re-registering their voter. This is their voter registration. It's not a specific village vote. Yes? No, this is a village vote. It is. This is only, so it's only, for, this the is only for the village. Only for the village. Day, for the village election. election. That day. That to bridge. vote for We've the never heard of this election. before. You've never done it before, I don't think. No. I've never done it before. And we're again, we're under no obligation to do so. We can simply do what we've done in the past, which is count on the roles provided to us by the Board of Elections. And then if there are any issues on the day of, we contend with the issues. Uh, I'd like to entertain a question from the audience, since we're on the topic. Yep. We're doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question, Kathleen McLean, to mm -hmm. Lizzie Lang, but also New York City. Come up, come up to the microphone. Or Kathleen, you could be back at back in your. Do you want to take it back? I know. Bossy, bossy. I know. I feel loved. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in hearing this because I am registered, I'm a registered voter in New York City and my wife Zena is registered out here. <clears throat> so I've never been able to vote in a village election. And so what we're saying here is that um, I can, so I have my regular, I can't, I can't vote for Congress twice or President or Senate, but I can vote you for- You also can't vote for mayor twice. Oh, so I, if I vote out here, I can't vote against. No, you're voting the mayor. for the mayor here. Gotcha. Un understood. Okay. So then it makes sense because I own property here, Thanks, and I'd like mayor. a say in my local government. Mm -hmm. um, so if I vote in this election in June, there is no mayoral election in November. So I don't have to worry about. Well, it. I, I meant the mayor of. <laughs> of this you village. said mayor, and I said the village. Right. Really, so you're, you're not voting for two times for a exactly. mayor in the village. Or exactly. Once. But you can okay. still vote in New York City. You can still, can still vote, vote in New York City. Oh, my God. Because technically that's, that's fantastic. Mm. Oh, my God. That just made me so happy. <laughs> I, I wish that, Thank I you wish for we turning that in. To give it to the election task force <laughs> to discuss, because they could have spent two months discussing that. Maybe four. <laughs> maybe four. <laughs> Thank you. But you don't have to be a, a property owner. Right, you're just a resident of the village. Because I know we're talking about the property, but you, resident you, of the village. right. Good. That's great. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah. Thank you. So going on to additional changes, I've also included a resolution to waive the residency requirement for an election inspector. It's not something I expect that we'll need to use, but it's a safety measure in the event that we don't have enough election inspectors and from the village, so let me explain that. That'll go on to, it's going to overlap with my third point about the election. In the past, this board has approved numerous election inspectors for each election, something like 16, possibly more. What I've done this time, because those people served in about three to four hour blocks, what I've done for us this time is make those blocks from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And we have four election inspectors for each block of time to which they agree to wholeheartedly and I'll be asking for alternate election inspectors as well. Everyone that you see on this list has served for us already and is also on the Suffolk County Board of Elections Certified Election Inspector list. It's my understanding that that was not always the case with previous inspectors and I don't have a level of comfort with that. So 
everyone that we have is coming off the certified election inspector list, number one. The reason I'm asking to waive the requirement is for the alternates in the event, it's again, a safety measure, once I solidified the alternates, which I hope will be by our next meeting, upcoming, our agenda meeting, um, if one of those people is not a resident, then we can proceed with that person working for us. But, but currently the list that we have of non-alternates are all residents. Correct. That's correct. Okay. And, and I think it's important to note, and I want to thank the inspectors for taking on those longer blocks of time, which again, I think, I think will make it, um, a little bit more intimate and not chaotic for anyone. Okay. That's my, that's my understanding of it. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Okay. So moving on to the rest of my report, you see that we have a proposed contract between the village and the rowing club. It says attached. It was not attached. And that is because the proposed contract was sent to our insurance company for review and comment. I just received their comments back today. Once those comments are incorporated into the contract, that will, of course, appear during our regular agenda meeting at the end of the month. Moving on to the RFP section on the capital assets, that is opening tomorrow, and we already have two uh, responses, actually. So that's very exciting. The RFQ for Sandsod and Bluestone was opened yesterday. As the mayor mentioned earlier, the bunker renovation is already in process. We received two quotes. One was wholly responsive to the question <laughs> to what we asked for, which was a sand, stone, and sod. Okay, so in the essence of time, and because work has already begun, the country club manager has asked if we would approve a resolution this evening, which would award that bid so that work can continue in conjunction with what's already being done. Is that acceptable to everyone. So that being the case, I would like to offer a resolution accepting the quotation submitted by Delia Landscape Supplies, Inc. in the amount of $186,665 for the provision of sand, sod, and bluestone for the Village of Port Jefferson Country <coughs> Club per the bid opening on March 12, 2024, and authorizing Mayor Shepro to execute any corresponding required documents. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And Trustee Lax was an aye as well. Thank you so much. That's very helpful to the process. So this is not a ratification issue. This is we just resolved that uh, this uh, RFP award was um, approved. Yes. Do we need move to move forward? Do we need to reapprove this at our agenda meeting? No, you just did. Correct. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Smaller item, uh, liquor license applications. I've instituted a process whereby when liquor license applications are received in the clerk's office, those are transmitted to the building department. That wasn't previously done. It was important to me that that be the case so that building can actually review the liquor license applications and ensure that those applications are consistent with the site plan approval. Okay, so that is happening effective last week. <laughs> Under local laws, we have local law number three, which was for the Parks and Rec Advisory Council, and just to report that was sent to the Department of State as required. There will be some additions to my report, which include three resolutions ratifying the hiring of seasonal laborers at the country club, a resolution approving the event application for the annual maker fair uh, scheduled for June 8th, and resolution accepting the quotation submitted by Grucci in the amount of $29,425 to provide our annual 4th of July fireworks, which by the way will be held on the 3rd with a rain date of the 6th. Okay. Nope, same as last year. They said that, yes, yes, they kept it 
for us. Kept it level. Court update, I wanted to thank our clerk, Elizabeth Kidney, who put in an inordinate amount of work for the approval of the destruction of aged materials. It's quite a process through the court system. She finally received approval recently to properly destroy aged items per the retention schedule. So we are undertaking a village-wide process for this. The documents that will be destroyed by the court um, properly will be shredded. When we have the shredding company on site, we will also have building department and clerk's office items that can be properly shredded per the retention schedule, shredded at the same time, thereby freeing up space in both Village Hall and at our storage facility. So I wanted to thank her for helping us with that process because now it helps us village-wide. Can we just give examples of what would be shredded um, and have those things been um, digitized previously? Just, just to... I, anytime government says we are shredding documents, even though obviously it's to, to the standard, mm -hmm. uh, just for more explanation to the public. I think that the, it's my understanding that the building department documents are all digitized or in the process of being digitized. Many of the clerk's office documents are digitized. The documents for the court that are no longer needed are, uh, for example, viola old violations, um, old tickets, old receipts that are no longer required. Whether those are digitized, I can't speak to, but I know that nothing will be, I can say confidently that nothing will be destroyed without proper procedure. And that sometimes also includes documentation with sign off of destruction, what was done, when was done, and who approved it. Thank you. You're welcome. Just while well, we're speaking of uh, digital, um, is there any update on the timeline of migrating over from Gmail um, to the other? Because it occurred to me that um, what happens to all of the Google documents that are on our accounts right now? The treasurer and I just spoke about that today, as a matter of fact. I'm looking for a timeline. I should have it by the end of the week. We've started various IT conversations. One of them was a meeting with all of our IT providers, and that was regarding the website. So that one's in process first, and the migration is happening. We're just waiting for an assignment to a manager for that so that we should know more by the end of the week. Thank you. And I yeah, look, look forward to that and just... Uh... I, I imagine these questions are being asked, but again, uh, you know, being a trustee, you're working with your um, different committees. The committees have made documents. We've made, doc you know, we've saved mm -hmm. PDFs to our Google Drive. I just want to sometimes when emails disappear, then all of those documents do as well. So I just want to make sure that it's. It is my understanding with the migration, all of the emails are going to be backed up. Yeah, we've we've every everything that's in your account will be backed up. Uh, backed up like accessible yes. immediately to to us. Yes, we would insist that to make sure that they are accessible. That's they need super helpful. Thanks. So yeah, the, the emails and then um, you know also the again these like the Google spreadsheets and the docs and all. Um, but really good to hear about the emails because starting fresh would be rough. And not especially for you. Not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That actually concludes my report, unless anyone has questions. Thank you. Treasurer Gafka, you're up. Good evening. I have a little bit of a lengthy report. There's a lot to go through. Um, but I want to touch on a couple points that were made previously. Um, we were talking about uh, the highway department is working with Suffolk County Water Authority about paving and making sure that they repave the roads and to a satisfactory condition. We we had a meeting with National Grid uh, over the last month talking about some of the issues that the village has had with taking care of the roads and some of the conditions that the roads have been left in. And in those, we had a very positive discussion uh, about how we're trying to take care of village assets and 
and really make sure that we're leaving the roads in a condition that are safe and drivable for everybody after the work has been done. Um, in conjunction with that, National Grid did contribute a little over $110,000 towards paving, uh, which should ha occur next year during the next fiscal year, um, on some of the roads that they did a lot of work on. Uh, once uh, the highway superintendent and myself were able to sit down and hammer out a budget with the grant funding and CHIPS funding that is available, uh, I believe that that list will be discussed publicly uh, as to what the intentions are for that paving project. So I wanted to touch on that. Uh, we did receive the safety nets. They came today and they believe they were delivered up to 88 North Country. Uh, so they, they should be up there. Um, what is the system that they're using to put those up, take them down? Are they up permanently? What What's the system? I would defer to, to the parks uh, super supervisor on that question, but I believe they should be able to be put up and then taken down in the off season. They'll be installed themselves. Yes, but my I guess my question is, is it a pulley system that, uh, oh, you know. I think it's a permanent. When, when they put it up, I don't think it, it retracts. I think it's, it's there for the season. This, okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, one additional note, um, I'm hoping, uh, I know that Trustee Laux stated that the ice skating revenue was around 104. Um, I believe that there's still some more revenue due to come in. I think that number will actually go even a little bit higher. I think we should exceed our budgeted revenue amount uh, for the year because we still have two weeks in March and I think there's one more week in February. Um, so that's just positive news yes. But I wanted to touch on those. Just, quick, just back to the nets again. Can, Bob, would you mind engage, you know, talking to Parks and see, send us photos of what that's going to look like before it actually goes up? I, I don't have any concept of the installation plan or how it, how it's installed, what the structure looks like. You know what? It, it's it's a wire going across the poles that, that are there. So and then the, the netting is attached to that wire. Okay. And how Maybe how tall is it? Sorry. Thirty feet. Yeah. I think it's thirty feet. I'm just. Thinking of the birds, just we just keep an eye to see that they're not getting. Sometimes things birds will get stuck, and then I'm foreseeing the upset resident calls about that. Mr. Tuckish. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just if he has images of what the installation, not not our installation, but installation the, the vendor right. has Im images, I'm sure of, and maybe ask the vendor, are there any you know issues with birds flying into the into the nets. Thank you. I think sometimes they'll they'll have um, extra little flags or, or um, essentially the nets are often uh, not visible to birds unless you put sort of yeah, ribbons or something on there. So we'll do like purple for the royals or something. We'll make it look decorative if, uh, if necessary. Um, in conjunction with the resolution that the board voted on this evening regarding the bid opening for Delay Assad, um, I will be introducing an additional uh, budget amendment resolution to fund uh, that bid opening, uh, likely from fund balance from the country club. Um, so that will need to be done. I also have a resolution on uh, in my agenda uh, for the bunker bid to, to fund that, um, you know, for the March 27th meeting. Um, getting into my report, uh, just a couple items to go over because it's it, it might it's going to be new uh, to this board and new to this village really. Um, the harbor front walkway project is complete. We've received, um, you know, we received part of the funding. We're still waiting on the county, but I believe that that's in process. Uh, so what I, my first budget uh, transfer is going to do is move, take decrease the expense and move that money back to general. Essentially, close that project out. So then it will be a zero net. You know, there won't be any expenses left on the line. Um, and that project will be finished. Uh, so that's one That's one of my resolutions. Um, I have another resolution uh, that I'm gonna create a new capital fund expense account um, for highway, and it's gonna be labeled H5110200. Um, previously, um, and in conjunction with the capital auditors, one of the recommendations that they made, um, we've all of our capital accounts have had the same numbers, you know, the same item numbers, 8997. And then another, you know, kept going sequentially higher and higher and higher. What you're really supposed to do is tie it to your budget, right? So our highway budget is in 5110. So you have capital lines in the H fund 5110 to tie so you know what the capital expense is relating to. Um, so 
when we bought the sweeper, uh, the sweeper was intended to be purchased with parking funds, with, uh, you know, the cash generated from, from the meters. Uh, there was a journal entry done to record at the expense on the general fund side and a due to do from to capital. That money never made it to capital. Um, we pay yearly. Uh, we make a payment every year for that sweeper up until 2027, $63,000 a year. That, so we paid that out of capital. The capital is now owed that money. But we need to record the asset in the highway for capital so that it's clear that it's a highway piece of equipment. It's not parking funds equipment. It's the highway equipment. So that is what this budget amendment does. Um, we have paid the first payment last year. Um, my intention is to get this in place so that when we make the next payment, all of the cash for the next payment is there. We will eventually have to do additional budget amendments to fund 2020, you know, the rest of 2026 and 2027 uh, for the sweeper so that it's fully paid off. Um, but that is funded through capital and it will be, it will be a, a highway equipment line, line item. <laughs> I don't know if you got it's a little complicated, but I don't know if you guys have any questions about that. Do you have to go through every single capital line and renumber it? I'm not going to renumber. Okay. The new what I'm what, I'm what I'm going to do is each subsequent project that we have, I'm going to try and create a new capital line so that it is tied with the expense that it belongs to per uh, gap standards with New York State, which is the general generally accepted accounting principles. So you you know, if you buy something for parks, it should be labeled 7110 for parks, recreation, so on and so forth, tied to what you see in your general fund is what you would see with your capital fund. Um, so that is what that's about. Um, additionally, uh, I have a budget amendment to record the East Beach Bluff. We are going to, uh, we're going to be converting that ban into a bond, the first part of it the $5.2 million that we got in April of 22. Now, why am I doing that? We're doing that because there is no grant funding or other revenue sources available to cover the cost on that portion of the bond. So the phase one is completely on, it's got, has to be funded through debt service. So there's, it makes no sense in the discussions with Munistat, who are our financial advisors, to keep it on the books as a ban and to roll it over every year. It makes more sense, convert it to the bond, lock in the debt service, and going forward, we'll have a scheduled amount every year that I already know what the, the debt service will be um, for the next you know, 10, 12 years. What is that annual debt service? It's right around 475,000. Annually? Yes. For eight I, year, nine I years? I believe it's gonna be closer to 15 years. It, it will go down, Although, you know, the last, you know, four to five years will be less than the 475, but- That's interest in everything. That's right? everything, yes. But we know what that number is. It's a known quantity now. The second phase will be funded largely through grant funds. Um, and, and so that will stay a ban. And hopefully there are some ideas that me and, and uh, <laughs> that the treasurer's office and, and our financial advisors have had to try and make it so that when we do that borrowing, we combine it with the other outstanding ban that we have so that there's just one ban borrowing. Um, so that as the grant funds come in, we can pay that down to, to bring that debt service down. And just to clarify, there is no opportunity to pay additional principal early, right? You can't- Not on a bond, yeah. no. Um, not on a bond. And to, to be honest with the way um, and I'll be reporting on this in just a little bit, with the way that the budget has been created and I've gone through it, I don't really see a lot of room uh, to increase that amount um, to, to pay that down. The, yeah. There's only so much that mm -hmm. you can pay mm -hmm. and you need the cash to back that up as well. And, and we're not in a position and until I get the results of the capital audit to know how much can we pay down. With a, you can pay additional principal down on the ban, but there's no funding source for it. So it is going to come one way or the other from the general fund. So let's pretend there was additional funding source for it. Just, just you know, go with it, right? Mm -hmm. If you did pay the principal down more quickly, the interest would be reduced over time, no? And then 
you pay it off more quickly like you could do for your mortgage or car payment or or is that allowed or not allowed do you know what i'm saying for a band that is allowed you can pay you can pay more you can allocate more funds to, to the principal interest. payment yes uh -huh. okay um but not for a bond not for a bond, bond. unless they fall but you have to you have to have a revenue source to back that up, right? So the revenue source there is no revenue source for for the bond this part of the phase. It's just general fund monies. It's taxpayer appropriations, um, which goes into kind of the note that I have in here on the resolution. We had made a you know one of the reasons why I've I've tried to preface that I have certain fund balance numbers for the general fund but I'm not confident in it is because there are items like the notation that I have here in my work session that I'm finding as I go along. And that um, in discussion with the capital auditors, when they finally have a conclusion, they'll be making recommendations as to what the state of the general fund fund balance really is. But basically we made a payment towards this ban without having funds appropriated. There's no revenue source. Our fund balance wasn't appropriated. So we paid it in cash. So we owe, the fund balance owes the capital fund revenue source. So it owes at least $200,000 of fund balance to the capital fund. So let's go back to the way capital projects and money was handled. Before your arrival, when all the capital projects were in one lump, is that, is that part of the unraveling that you're talking about? It is part of that, yes. Um, it was also a timing issue. Um, and basically when you, they borrowed the money after the budget was set. So when you borrow money after the budget set, the debt service comes in 12 months later for a ban. It's, it's just, that's how, what happens. So they set the debt service for the next April, which that amount wasn't in the budget. So it had to get paid. What should have happened is that fund balance should have been appropriated to pay it so that there's a revenue source in capital. I'm short $200,000 from that in the, my capital budget amendment because I'm going to need to appropriate fund balance. I'm not comfortable doing that yet because I don't know the results of the capital audit. I want to wait to see what PKF O'Connor Davies comes back with after they do the complete analysis to decide, you know, how do we want to start fixing the capital fund? What are their recommendations? I'm not there yet, but it is something that will need to happen because those funds weren't appropriated. They weren't budgeted. So it's really fund balance. And um, so it's 200,000 towards principal, 99,000 towards the interest. It's about 300 grand. Are there any questions on that? If they weren't appropriate, just point of order, if you will. So they're not appropriate. Did the board vote on this? No, no, we're statutorily required to make these payments okay. or we go in default. Um, it should have, but we knew that this payment was coming 12 months in advance. So it should have been appropriated prior to the, you know, prior to the payment being made. Um, would have been the right procedure to do it. Um, I think that covers that aspect. I may have additional um an additional budget amendment to fund the RFP for the capital assets once that's opened. Um, so that I don't know how much that's gonna come in at, but we will need to appropriate funding to get that done. Um, so I will be coming to the board for that. I've also, um, there may be, depending on when uh, some of the projects come in and when the roof bid, I would defer to Clerk Perillo on the, on the roof bid. When is that scheduled to be open, do you know? Notice next week. No, notice next week. Okay. So probably sometime in April, likely we'll have funding for whatever the results of are that roof bid. Um, but the intention is, depending on what the board decides, to use ARPA funding to fix all of those roofs, right? So we got the Chandlery, we've got the Village Center, Village Hall, and DPW, which is the worst offender currently. So um, I don't know how much it's going to come in at, but it should take a significant amount of the, the ARPA funding that's available. I've also had discussions with our recreation director on some of the properties, uh, some of the defects in the properties around the Village Center, some of the walls that need to be fixed. Um, and then we have skating, the skating rink equipment that needs to be upgraded. I believe we have some quotes from, from the rinks uh, to fix some of that equipment. 
Um, so that may be part of what we try to allocate ARPA funds for. The Zamboni. No. No, not for the Zamboni. Zamboni's fine. <laughs> More for the infrastructure to getting the the, the cooling oh. uh, liquid, you know. Got it. Going from R22 to the oh, Yeah, the conversion technology. to safer technology. Environmentally friendly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I did ask our um, our park supervisor to try and get some quotes for the walkways around Rocket Ship Park. Um, if you've walked down there, you can and see even going all the way down to Barnum. Uh, there's some issues that's kind of it sunk down a little bit, some of the, the bricks. So I did ask for several different kinds of quotes uh, to look at, you know, stamp concrete, what would it look like to the bricks, um, maybe blacktop. It ultimately, yeah. it depends on what the board, what direction the board would like to go in um, for that. But I am hoping to get some prices in on that soon. Um, going on to the tax levy. I talked with the state controller's office. Uh, while they're not pleased that we weren't reporting the correct tax levy, they just believe it is in their opinion that because we have a handle on what the issues are, that we're fixing it going forward, correct it, move forward. So that's the plan. Uh, there's not going to be any um, any type of penalty monetarily or otherwise. Just fix, report the right previous tax levy, and move forward with the right calculation. For those of us just tuning in, could you give a two-minute why that was necessary and what had happened prior to your arrival? Okay. So... There was a little bit of a disconnect, and I believe part of it is we collect bid taxes for the bid. Um, the bid cannot collect taxes on its own, so we collect those taxes for the bid through the commercial properties. The bid being the business, business improvement, improvement district. district. Excuse me. Uh, so that the state says those taxes you collect have to be part of your tax levy. I believe in years past that has not been part of the reported tax levy. I think that's part one. And then part two, because of the glide path, uh, which is the national grid property and the limitations that we have on the taxes there, that there are some, uh, we have a limit. So we have to build our tax rate with the fact that we know that we can only go up to so high for that glide path. So some calculation errors were made over the course of time. I have put into process um, a review with our assessor and our senior tax receiver and my office to, we're all going to sit together once the assessed valuation has been completed, the final roll, and we'll determine the rate based off of what the recommended amount of taxes that we're going to collect, because that's what's going to determine the rate, what the budget, uh, the final budget allocates, and we will come up with that rate. Um, and we'll make sure that it's the right number so that at the end we collect the right amount of taxes. What that means is that from my, what I could see is that eight out of the last nine years, we over collected based off of what we reported to the state. So our tax levy was higher than what we reported to the state. It also means that in eight of the last nine years, we exceeded the 2% cap, uh, whether it was intended or not. We, it was always voted on to pass it. So there is no legal, there's no, we're legally allowed to do what we did. But we did pierce it in eight out of the last nine years, and we reported the wrong levy to the state in eight of the last nine years. So that will be corrected going forward. And they're happy with that. Um, apparently, we're not the only municipality in New York State that has this issue. So it is not, we're not unique. Um, but we do have a good handle on it going forward. Um, and if you had to characterize the um, collaboration with the tax assessor and the senior tax collector, how would you characterize that type of collaboration with the treasurer's office? Um, so what what I need, when we sit together, we're going to look at the total valuation of all the properties in the village. We're going to make sure that we know what the valuation is of that national grid property versus the residential commercial properties. We're going to look at, as we build our tax rate, when we hypothetically put in the amount of taxes we need, will it actually kick out a rate that when you apply it to the valuations gives you the number that you said you're going to collect. So that is what we're going to sit down and we're going to go over all of those numbers and make sure that they're all accurate and that there's no questions about what we're dealing with. Um, the way we are going to build this budget and the way it should be built is we determine what our total expenses are 
and what our total revenue is and how many how much do we need to collect in taxes and that number is what dictates the rate the rate shouldn't dictate how much taxes you collect you should know that number and then that's your number you don't go above that number it's there will be breakage it's not exact science because of property values they're not exact but it, that's the number so it needs to be around that number within a few hundred at most a thousand it sounds like you might be looking at this as part of that puzzle, but uh, could we get either now or if you need to look into it and then at the next meeting, um, an update on the glide path for the IDA uh, given tax breaks for the large apartment buildings? Uh, is that my understanding was that's not a binary? Uh, um, the the amount of taxes that were being had to be paid is reduced for a certain amount of time. Is that a glide path? Or it's yeah, it's we there are agreements in place for each one of those developments, right. um, which the assessor is aware of. So we don't collect property tax on those. Uh, right now, it comes in as a pilot payment. OK. Um, and then so we'd have to look at each individual property that was given those one of those IDA tax breaks to see what those individual agreements were and what their end point is. Um, I don't have that information, but I, I can look into it. It's a great question. It. Yeah. I'd love to see that, too. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Just so that we Generally, can. Generally, they pay the same tax they were paying before the property was developed for a certain amount of time, and then it slides up. There you go. Yeah, I'd lo love to take a look at those agreements so that we can, again, projecting into the future, uh, know what we're going to be looking at, because hopefully it'll be a happy thing to look at uh, as more taxes are coming in. Yes, it would be. Um, going into it, I have uh, I've had preliminary conversations about finalizing a tentative budget. There are some tweaks that need to be made, but the hope is, is that I will have a presentation for the board and the mayor and the public at the 27th as to what the tentative budget is going to look like. Um, that will change based off of what the board between the 27th and really the 31st or, you know, will accept um, board comment and, and and what they believe needs to change if they have any recommendations between that and the preliminary budget hearing. So we'll take all of those comments in, um, we'll implement them, and then we'll have the preliminary budget hearing on the 10th of April where we'll seek public comment. And then we'll, we'll go from there and then hopefully have a budget by the 24th of April that can be voted on and adopted. Presentation on March 27th? Yes. PowerPoint slides, I believe. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank All right. you. Um, almost done. He's still going. He's still going. I know. It's a, it's a lengthy one. I apologize. <laughs> we received the audited financials for 2023, um, which were distributed to the board, um, and they should be sent to the Woo village website. Here they are. Everybody see them? May 13th. Today. It's March 13th. I mean, March 13th. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. But they will be posted to the village website hopefully sometime tomorrow after they get sent to the, the clerk's office digitally um, to be posted. And did you send all these to the Board of Trustees? To the. I believe they were all sent digitally. Uh, I need additional hard copies. I did not receive enough hard copies. Stay the tree. I'll look at it digitally. Okay. Does anybody else? Would I'll just ask the board now. Would anybody else like hard copies of that, or is the did? I'd rather have a hard copy. It's okay. Easy to read. That's fine. I'll, I'll do the digital because I won't get back here to get the hard. Any any highlights that you want to bring to the attention during this work? Session? Um, a lot of a lot of it stayed the same. Um, we did have a reduction in our total. Um, uh, our net position went down because we did a lot of the work and spent the money on the East Beach project over 2023. So the net position went down. We still have the same material weakness without having a capital fixed asset, which hopefully we will have rectified um, or at least in process to be rectified uh, for fiscal 2025. Um, you know, it's the same record. It, it's, a, it's a very similar report to the 2022 report. Not a lot, you know, same recommendations. We need to fix the capital fund, uh, the general fund fund balance. Um, I believe it went it went up a little tiny bit, um, but like I said, I don't have a lot of confidence in that number. Um, 
I will once we have a resolution to the capital fund and know what needs to be done and how much fund balance may need to be appropriated. And are we inviting Colin and Danowski in to present this to us? Uh, I would defer to the board if they would like this presented to them by Colin and Danowski. Would the board like a presentation from Colin and Danowski? I will reach out to, to Chris Reno and I will try and get that set up. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, there's. Not done. I know, I know, well, I know, I know. Thank you for no. this. This was a heavy lift. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. Went back and well, forth. there are there are a lot of updates about the grants in my report. Without going through each one, I just ask: Does Important. anybody have any questions about any of those grant updates? Okay. Oh, last thing I promise. I would recommend to the board that the highway superintendent's recommending we have two vehicles: one for parks, one for highway that are basically not inspectable going forward. Uh, we need to get two new vehicles as part of the, the leasing program. Um, there, are, there are monies going to be available within the budget next year that because there are some things dropping off of our total leases that we have with the Village of Port Jefferson for our equipment and, and otherwise. So I, I feel comfortable that we're not gonna be adding expense by bringing in two more vehicles through the enterprise program. But there is a parks truck that is currently lopsided with the back end that I, Steve, uh, the highway superintendent, does not believe will pass inspection. And there is a highway truck that is rotting out that we really need to get two new cars in. Um, the expectation is that is the addition. And then the following year, we're going to look at, I believe, our code vehicles. There's four of them that need to be then re-upped. Our four-year lease term is up, and maybe we're going to look into in discussions with the code officer types of vehicles that we can implement that may reduce the cost. So I just recommend I, I seek uh, board input on if they are comfortable with us moving forward with getting those two additional vehicles um, as part of the leasing program. Is that in your 2025 budget or in this budget? 2025. We won't get it until the 20. They won't be ready until 2025. And so you've budgeted for it? Yes. Okay. Any questions about that? No. Nope. I spoke to Steve about that. He's, they badly need it. Yeah, they do. Yep. It's a good, I think it's a, a good strategy for, for making it a seamless transition year over year. Yeah. And right. the, the hope is, is that we get to a point where we're actually reducing the cost over time because we're building equity in the vehicles. So, okay. That's it. Sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Village Attorney David Moran. Continued work in our, uh, our court, Village Court, in reference to year old violations and people trying to bring their either residents or commercial entities into compliance. Um, while lingering in the in in the village court system since 2020, 2021, 2022, um, we're just about there with all of the 20 to 25 cases that were inherited, um, getting them off our docket and into the building department for some some level of compliance, um, which is a step in the right direction. In that effort, we've discovered some significant flaws in the way that process has been handled in the past, that process being the issuance of appearance tickets, um, the veracity of the accusatory instruments used to prosecute um, violators of the village code. And in furtherance of that effort, next Saturday, we're doing a class um, with the fire marshals, uh, most of Andy Freeling's staff, um, Elizabeth Kidney from, from the court, just what it means to write a, a sufficient accusatory instrument the necessary documents needed under the um, bail re bail reform laws, as far as discovery, retention, notes, all things that we the, that the prosecutor would need to properly prosecute a, a case. Um, we have a three three hour uh, ten to one on um, not this Saturday, next Saturday, 
um, in the village in the village building department over there. So that should be very, very beneficial moving forward. And once we cross that hurdle in anticipation of getting through that process and getting um, a little more form um, to, to the process to make it less arduous as it currently is because there's really no procedure. Um, in anticipation of that, we have sent letters to known or, or persistent violators saying, hey, you have violations on your property. Basically saying, once we get our stuff together, we're, we're going to come and pay you a visit. But between now and then, if you have an expired permit or you have this or you have that, pl please come and spare yourself the the agony of the justice court. Um, so it, it's a it's a carrot and stick approach. Um, and I, I think ultimately it'll yield success. Um, but that's kind of where we're at um, with that process. So that's basically what above and beyond the daily rigors of the job that's what we're doing and uh, any update on the bamboo code i'm reviewing multiple codes sent over um i have a couple of issues that i'll address with andy um but for the most part we'll, we'll be there it'll get there thank you thank you now uh we adjourn to executive session do I have a motion to adjourn into a negative session? Motion. Yeah. <laughs> motion. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we stay here? Let's stand.